Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Genome Webinars. I'm Allison Baksh, Marketing Manager at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. The title of today's webinar is Non-Invasive Characterization of Solid Tumors via NGS Liquid Biopsy Testing. This webinar is sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Our speaker today is Dr. Gorka Alcorda Aranburu, who is the co-director of Solid Tumor and Constitutional Disease Diagnostic Laboratory at the University of Navarra. This webinar is pre-recorded, and we will ask our speakers several pre-submitted questions after their talks have concluded. However, you may still type in questions at any time during the webinar, which our expert will address after the webinar has ended. You can do this through the Q&A panel, which appears on the right side of the webinar presentation. If you look at the bottom tray of your window, you will also find a series of widgets to enhance your webinar experience. With that, let me turn it over to Dr. Gorka. Hi, everyone, and thanks to Thermo Fisher for organizing this webinar. My name is Gorka Alcorta Aramburu, and I represent CIMA Lab Diagnostics of the University of Navarra in Spain, as well as the Genomics Core Facility of the Health Research Institute of Navarra, also called IDISNA. The main goal of today's talk is to tell you a little bit about our experience with Thermo Fisher's on-combined pan-cancer cell-free assay on our ongoing technical as well as clinical validation to implement non-invasive characterization of solid tumors via next-generation sequencing liquid biopsy testing. Here, I will briefly review how liquid biopsy can be considered as an alternative non-invasive method to tissue biopsy for cancer molecular characterization. Liquid biopsy allows the study of tumor-specific circulating components, including circulating tumor cells or CTCs, circulating cell-free tumor DNA, and even RNA. This new approach brings both great potential and new challenges to precision medicine. Since proficiency testing as well as interlaboratory comparison are key for a successful implementation of the molecular of the methodology within a laboratory, both aspects will be highlighted. Additionally, what cell-free nucleic acid means as well as some aspects of the NGS technology will be discussed. In the process of ISO 15189 accreditation, similar diagnostics has experience in flow cytometry and genetics in hematological, oncological, and constitutional diseases, offering identification of biomarkers for diagnosis, prognosis, or therapeutic decision making. In addition, we support research projects and our clinical trials as the Edisna Genomics Core Facility, oscillation and characterization of nucleic acids, Droplet digital PCR, pyro sequencing, Sanger, and NGS sequencing, based on both Illumina and Thermo Fisher platform under a framework that provides clinical assistance. Technological versatility and scalability has allowed us to participate in very different research projects, while we have in NGS based Thermo Fisher on command solutions for tissue biopsy, including BRCA1 and BRCA2 to the tumor mutational burden through OFA, OCA, and childhood, as well as on-combined pan-cancer cell-free assay for liquid biopsy. Then both NGS-based tissue and liquid biopsy analysis are performed with Thermo Fisher on-combined solution. The characterization of especially by NGS-based assays allows to identify individuals at risk of hereditary cancer, in addition to molecular characteristics of the tumor, that guide the selection of treatment, disease monitoring, early detection of cancer, or even diagnosis of rare cancers or cancers of a known origin. So the understanding the molecular profile of each tumor by characterizing the genome of cancer cells isolated from tissue biopsies has become one of the most important pillars of precision medicine. However, a tissue biopsy for further molecular study is not always possible due to the location or small size of the tumor and the complexity of the surgery. In addition, even when it can be obtained, the tissue biopsy may not reflect the current tumor situation since, for example, the biopsy was obtained before some treatment or it does not reflect the genetic heterogeneity of the disease. 
Ideally, we characterize the tumor through a non-invasive test, considering that the tumors release tumor cells, nucleic acids, exosomes, and other components that circulate freely in the bloodstream or other body fluids. That's exactly what liquid biopsy does, by characterizing the components that the tumor releases to different body fluids. Liquid biopsy is becoming an alternative to tissue biopsy, since biopsy, including several genetic and epigenetic alterations, can not only be found in cell-free DNA, but the FDA and EMA already approved that patients with lung cancer should be treated even when the EGFR mutation has been identified by liquid biopsy. In addition, liquid biopsy allows monitoring the clinical course of patients following the evolution of cancer, both evaluating the response to treatment, but also the appearance of resistance to treatment in real time, even before clinical symptoms appear. Therefore, liquid biopsy allows changing the treatment when the tumor cells have acquired a resistant mutation such as EGFR T7M0M, even before clinical features develop. Furthermore, the liquid biopsy will reduce both cost and result turnaround time from a week to a couple of three days, while further improving early disease detection as well as the study of tumor latency and evaluation of both heterogeneity and dynamics of primary and metastatic tumors. We have been studying cell-free DNA, BRAF, and EGFR point mutations by droplet digital PCR within both clinical as well as research settings. However, when we decided to implement NGS-based liquid biopsy studies, including cell-free RNA analysis, we encountered that the concordance and clinical validity of commercial cell-free nucleic acid tests were under debate, and there was a lack of standard operating procedures and guidelines. The European Committee for Standardization already requests that centers where comparative studies are carried out comply with the standards defined by the International Organization for Standardization, ISO, such as ISO 15189. On the other hand, multicenter studies to establish both the technical and clinical validity of existing platforms are also needed before assessing their clinical validity. We encountered two pretty different commercial products, Warden Health's complete but closed product, and Thermo Fisher's closed kit but with access to raw data, which is important for validation QC steps. And this is where I would like to show some of the comparative studies that we have done in similar diagnostics, where we are in the process of ISO 15189 accreditation for both tissue as well as liquid NGS-based assays. In order to guarantee reproducibility during the technical validation, our goal was to standardize the optimal sample collection, conservation, and subsequent manipulation within similar diagnostics. We studied 16 plasma samples with the Thermo Fisher's Oncomine Pan Cancer Assay that had previously been studied by Garland Health. Keep in mind that both our hands as well as the genomic regions that each panel studied are different. My goal today is not to judge which of them is clinically more relevant. My goal is to see and show you if similar diagnostics can reproduce garden health results with Thermo Fisher's oncomine pan cancer reagents. Since the targeted regions are different, we focused on the 28 single nucleotide variants that both tests identified in those 16 samples and asked the following question. Are the frequencies of the variants obtained by similar diagnostics with Thermo Fisher's oncomine pan cancer reagents comparable to those of Garden Health? They are, when graph indicates, the x-axis represents the variant allele frequency values within Garden Health reports, and the y-axis the variant allele frequencies obtained in similar diagnostics with Thermo Fisher's oncomine pan cancer reagents, showing great correlation between the two assays. Although the allele frequency varies widely, a high proportion of patients have, all, have alleles with very low frequencies, as can be seen in the graph. Distinguishing variants with very low frequencies from sequencing errors is a challenge. The accurate and reproducible detection of low frequency mutations has significantly improved since the incorporation of molecular tags or barcodes called unique molecular identifiers, or UMIs, in NGS protocols. 
UMIs help reduce errors and quantitative bias introduced by amplification, explaining the high allele frequency correlation observed between the two solutions within this graph. One is to consider how copy number variant or fusion was identified by both solutions. Therefore, further studies are required to understand their concordance level. We also need to mention that we do have the raw data for one solution, but not the other one. Therefore, the variants that we compare were identified by one solution while reported by the other one. There are also significant differences between the targeted regions of interest, so as expected, the solution with the largest targeted area identified a higher number of variants. However, could we not detect variants in overlapping regions? Yes, we could due to, for example, lower cell free nucleic acid isolation efficiency, as well as any limiting factor in the library preparation, as well as sequencing steps. We have not been able to validate with an alternative method, such as droplet digital PCR, for lack of sample, but we do have very low frequency variants within regions targeted by both solutions, but only identified by one of them. Focusing on the variants, what does Thermo Fisher tell us about its limit of detection, or LOD? They say that they provide sufficient reagents to study cell-free nucleic acid from a 10 mil blood sample and detect single nucleotide variants, or SMVs, at 0.1% enabling cancer genetic studies from just five nanograms of input selfie nucleic acid. However, Thermo Fisher identifies single nucleotide variants if the alternative allele appears on more than two chromosomes. So if we want to identify variants that are at 0.1%, more than 2,000 chromosomes need to be studied. I'd like to tell you a little bit about how this particular NGS protocol allows identifying the number of original chromosomes that have been tested or studied per base. Using modified primers, each original molecule is labeled with a unique barcode called Unique Molecular Identifiers, or UMI. Thanks to these unique codes, we can group all the sequences that resulted from the amplification of each unique molecule in family. We could then say that each family represents a unique chromosome. Therefore, we consider sequencing errors variants that are not present within the majority of the sequences within one family, and we only inform variants that are present in at least two families, considering that they represent two independent chromosomes. This is the reason why to call each variant with precision, it is very important to provide sufficient input cell-free nucleic acid and sequencing to generate a large number of families. Therefore, we ask the following question. What is the quantity of cell-free nucleic acids that similar diagnostic needs to sequence on average more than 2,000 chromosomes with Thermo Fisher's oncomine pan-cancer reagent? Free nucleic acid seems to be needed to reach limit of detection values of 0.1% as shown in the following graph where the x-axis represents the starting nucleic acid material and the y-axis the average number of chromosomes studied within the targeted regions of interest for 28 samples. Interestingly, we see that the quantity of input cell-free nucleic acid and the number of studied chromosomes correlate significantly, and limit of detection values of 0.04 and even 0.02% can be obtained with 25 and 25 nanograms of cell-free nucleic acid. I would like to take a minute to talk about the, relevant, the relevance of the studied amount of nucleic acid when following a specific sequence change identified within a patient's liquid biopsy sample. For example, after the first patient's visit, we received 10 milliliters of blood from which roughly 50 nanograms of cell-free nucleic acid were obtained. On average, we could study 10,000 chromosomes and identify a variant at 0.05%, for example. However, during the patient's second visit, even from 10 milliliters of blood, imagine that we can only get 10 nanograms of cell-free DNA. This means that, on average, we can only sequence around 2,000 chromosomes. Thus, if the alternative allele needs to be present in two out of 2,000 chromosomes, or LOD value is 0.1%. 
This means that even though this patient may still have the same alternative allele at 0.05%, we are not going to be able to identify it. Even with this type of clinical utility has been demonstrated for two FDA-approved cell-free nucleic acid-based tests. On one hand, we have the COVAS EGFR mutation test, which detects EGFR mutations in plasma cell-free DNA from patients with lung cancer. And on the other hand, we have the epiprocolon, which detects CEPT9 promoter methylation level in plasma cell-free DNA from patients undergoing a screening for colorectal cancer. The cell search system is also an FDA-approved circulating tumor cell or CTC detector for patients with metastatic breast, prostate, or colon cancer. Indeed, in patients with metastatic cancer, the presence of more than or equal to five CTCs per 7.5 mils of blood was found to be a strong predictor for reduced progression-free survival and overall survival. However, it has not been shown that a patient with rising CTC or circulating tumor cell counts benefit from an early switch to another chemotherapy. We have also started if the NGS-based liquid biopsy identified variants modify patient treatment or segregate individuals based on their prognosis and or response to treatment. For example, the high-risk GI cancer clinic has provided us with 10 mil blood samples from individuals with more than 10 polyps, individuals with metastatic colon cancer, or unaffected control individuals. It is to be highlighted that a somatic APC mutation was identified in two out of blindly tested 16 blood samples. That of the four patients with metastatic colorectal cancer included in the study. This is interesting knowing that without an APC mutation, adenoma hardly becomes a carcinoma. However, it's significant that somatic TP53 mutations were identified in five out of six unaffected controls. Knowing that TP53 mutations are for disease to become invasive and are identified in 5% of adenoma, 59% of malignant polyps, and 75% of invasive colorectal cancers. It is worth to mention that typifications that closely resemble those observed in cancers have been discovered in non-cancerous tissues, and these have the potential to be identified in cell-free nucleic acid from individuals without cancer. Therefore, it has to be considered that the detection of a mutation in a cancer driver gene in cell-free nucleic acid is not proof for disease, considering that it could be a benign somatic event. However, three unaffected control individuals for which a somatic TP53 mutation was identified in their cell-free nucleic acid sample did present polyps or even those were smaller than five millimeters. I would like to get back to the limitation or LOD concept that I mentioned just a few slides before, since this table also reflects an interesting fact regarding LOD. Previously, I mentioned that a strong correlation between input cell-free nucleic acid amount and LOD was observed. However, y-axis reflects the average number of chromosomes studied within the targeted region. I should emphasize that the LOD values that I mentioned before is therefore also an average of the studied regions. Not the same number of chromosomes is sequenced within each targeted region. Thus, LOD or limit of detections varies between the regions of interest. For example, we can see how consistently lower than average number of families or chromosomes are studied within those TP53 variant locations when compared to the median molecular coverage obtained per studied samples. In other words, the detection varies between samples based on the amount of input nucleic acid studies as reflected by the left figure. However, the design of the NGS-based assay also affects the number of chromosomes studied per region, which translates to the non-uniform LOD observed within different regions of interest reflected by the figure on the right. Therefore, the goal is to achieve a limit of detection of 0.02%, for example, we need to know in how many of the targeted bases we have sequenced more than 5,000 chromosomes. 
If we have only sequenced more than 5,000 chromosomes within 20% of the bases, we should not say that our LOD is 0.02%, even though the average LOD could be 0.02%. This feature is not only important for clinical assistance, but also within research projects. For example, a research project in which variants identified in two groups of patients are compared could be significantly biased if simple, simply patients from one of the groups have consistently less cell-free nucleic acid within the same plasma volume. In summary, IOC has a great potential in precision medicine, but I hope that the relevance of both proficiency testing and interlaboratory comparison are seen as key elements for a successful implementation of the challenging methodology within a diagnostic laboratory given the inherited physiological challenges of the cell-free tumor components themselves. It is essential to continue improving the technology, including the molecular barcodes like UMIs, to distinguish low-frequency variants from sequencing errors, and at the same time, obtaining comparable variant allele frequencies across laboratories, as well as reporting proper LOV values across all regions of interest. One of the advantages of in-house testing is the ability to get access to results in a faster way. However, when choosing how to implement NGS-based liquid biopsy testing, capability of the implementing center should be assessed considering the procedures, equipment, and both cost and turnaround time from sample collection to result reporting. And with this, I turn back to Alison for questions. Thank you, Dr. Gorka, for that excellent presentation. As a reminder to our webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen. With that, let's get into the Q&A. What kind of tubes have you used for sample collection? If you've tried a different one, have you noticed differences in performances? Well, sample collection and shipping conditions do, do make a big difference, uh, both on the amount and especially quality of the nucleic acid isolated, as it has been shown by different publications. Some studies suggest that the regular EDTA tubes are... And we at least can centrifuge the samples and freeze the plasma within the first two or four hours. That's what we have implemented within our institution, both in Pamplona as well as in Madrid. So frozen plasma is shipped from Madrid to Pamplona, where similar diagnostics is located. However, it is true that we are currently testing the ability or at least capacity that some of those new tubes that have been developed to stabilize both cell-free DNA or cell-free RNA. Okay, great. How quickly are you able to, re uh, to produce a report in house? <clears throat> How long do you have to wait for the report to be back? So the external companies do send reports within seven to 10 days. And, and it is true that in house, the process can be completed two to three days faster, allowing earlier access to key information for both treatment as well as follow up, given that the sample doesn't need to, ship, to be shipped out. However, we also need to acknowledge that we cannot forget that one needs a minimal number of samples to be processed at, within the institution at the same time and still be cost effective. In do you have a range to suggest to use? The, the amplicon-based NGS technology um, has proven to be very effective, identifying alleles with very low frequency, especially now that UMIs have been included. And we have a way to distinguish them from sequencing errors. Even though it becomes more expensive, as long as we have enough cell-free nucleic acid, technically we can identify EGFR-resistant alleles at 2%, 0.2%, or even 0.02%. So I think what it has to be defined is at what LOD value the treatment of a patient is going to be changed, and that should define the range to be used. But I think at least 5,000 chromosomes should be tested when we are studying liquid biopsy samples. 
Have you done a correlation study also with a result from some samples from tissue? We have not. There are at least a couple of uh, big studies in which variants identified from tissue and liquid biopsy isolated uh, nucleic acid concordance levels have been studied. And it is not 100%, but it is very high. This is the reason why we think uh, liquid biopsy can allow non-invasive uh, longitudinal monitoring and reliable detection of clinically relevant mutations for patients like lung cancer. Okay, great. Do you have a plan to do a follow-up study on the CRC samples to check if those have polyps and went through surgery but would still have these mutations in the blood? We do, and we are working on that. As I would say other groups are and have already papers on that too. Given that identification of somatic alleles that represent tumoral cell-free DNA within the first visit after the surgery, is associated with worse prognosis. We still do not have a high enough number of cases to have our own, uh, our own final conclusion, but we do see cases in which variants identified in liquid biopsy are not identified after the surgery, even though similar or even higher number of chromosomes were tested. How do you handle reimbursement of the test if you are going to use this in routine? Reimbursement is it's a big hurdle to be considered when implementing NGS-based liquid biopsy. We do still have difficulties with NGS-based solid tumor reimbursement, but it is getting better. And therefore, I think reimbursement will get easier when, as I mentioned before, LOD values at which treatment is changed are defined. What are the advantages of in-house versus outsourcing? As I mentioned before, one of the advantages of uh, in-house testing is the ability to have full control of sample processing as well as generated data, access to results in a faster way and usually at a lower cost. However, the capacity that the center has to implement this type of test has to be well considered without forgetting the cost associated with procedure validation, equipment acquisition, as well as maintenance, and the need of a minimal number of cases to be cost and time effective, which could be soon overcome with the introduction of more flexible instrument like Genexus, where the need for sample accumulation before processing is reduced. Great, and our last question is, do you see liquid biopsy as a complementary technique or alternate to tissue biopsies? As of today, I see, I see liquid biopsy as an alternative solution for biomarker identification when a tissue biopsy cannot be tested. But you still need to get access to some of the conclusions of uh, bigger studies, ongoing bigger studies, to define LOD values at which treatment uh, will be changed, for example, and at the same time to understand how to identify, for example, the origin of TPCCC somatic mutations identified within cell-free DNA. All right, well, thank you again, Dr. Gorka, for your presentation and for doing the Q&A, and to our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific.